My name is Goldberry Long. I'm on the faculty at UCR. Where's all my students? <laughs> Woo! All Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm not used to megaphones. Hold it right up to your mouth. Hold it up to my mouth like that. Oh my God. <laughs> And I'll tell you another thing. All those crazy activist hippies really embarrassed me. I didn't like them. I wanted to be normal. I wanted to go with the flow. Even though my name was Goldberry, and I lived in a house with no running water, and I had an outhouse, and we were on food stamps, and I just wanted to shut up and get along. It's true. The notion of making a ruckus really bugged me. And I wanted to believe that the system was good. And when they started talking about those bad politicians and the evil government, I would cringe. That was me in my childhood. One of my earliest memories is looking at the TV set, which is going to prove how god-awful old I am, seeing some dude crying. And I said to my mom, oh, that's so sad, why is he crying? And that was Nixon, resigning. <laughs> but I grew up, and I started to teach this class. And the class that I teach is an introduction to creative writing class. And what I teach my students is that they have a right to be heard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that they have a right speak what's on their mind in their own voice. I teach them that and I have to overcome a lot of fear because a lot of them have been taught all their lives to shut up and get along, which I used to think was the right thing to do. And what I see in my students is people who, like me, grew up on welfare, on food stamps, maybe in houses with no running water, Maybe like me, they got their clothes from the free box and got made fun of for it, which happened to me. Or maybe they grew up in a middle class family, but they happen to be the only kid who's ever gone to, their co to a college because their parents barely made it past high school and worked three jobs just to support them. Or maybe their mother is a drug addict and their father is who knows where and until recently they were living in a car. Or maybe they only learned to speak English when they were 12 years old. I have all those people in my classes. And they are here at this school because they believe that the system was set up to do something good for them. Which I used to believe too. And I still like to believe when I get in front of my class and I tell my students, make your voice heard. Say what your truth is and say it loudly and say it in your own voice. So a couple weeks ago, I was on campus and I heard a ruckus <laughs> and I went to go check out what was going on. And I saw a whole bunch of students right over there speaking in their own voices to the system they're true. Yeah. Yeah. Just like I always told them to. <laughs> just like I used to be ashamed to do when I was a kid. And just like I was embarrassed about or when my elders did. And what I saw was that the students were speaking their truth and there was a barricade and on the other side of the barricade is what we call their elders or the system that I always thought should be considered good. And they had batons and rifles and guns and helmets and flak jackets to protect themselves from students speaking their truth in their own voices. And they were told, this is an unlawful assembly. This is illegal. 
stand up in front of my students and I tell them, you have a right to speak your truth. And nobody is allowed to harm you for it or make you stop. And then, as the day progressed, I saw more people in flak jackets with batons and guns standing around, lining the sidewalks while the students danced. <laughs> I saw this with my eyes. I bore witness to this. Mostly I bore witness because I'm still a little timid and because I was listening to them speak their truth. They are the ones who are harmed by this. They are the ones whose tuition goes up every year. They are the ones who are getting priced out of their education. They are the students who come to me in week four of the quarter, week four, begging to get into my classes because they have been waitlisted for every class they need to take and now they're going to get kicked out of school for not being properly fully enrolled and have to pay back their tuition because the university let them in but doesn't have a seat for them. I see this and it's a result of budget cuts and when our students danced in the streets and spoke their truth about what these budget cuts are doing to them and what these tuition increases are doing to them, they were met with men in helmets with batons and rifles and flak jackets. This is the United States of America. You are allowed to speak your truth. You have a constitutional right to speak your truth. Now, I stood there and I bore witness and I saw the soldiers standing on the sidelines with their batons across their chests. Oh, pardon me, did I say soldiers? I meant policemen. <laughs> and then I saw something that made me terrified. I saw a student running up the pedestrian mall next to the soccer fields, next to the place where our women play softball. I saw a student running up that sidewalk screaming, this is a protest, this is not a war. And behind him, marching up the pedestrian mall in formation, in army khaki uniforms, with helmets on their heads, and batons, and rifles, were soldiers, oh pardon me, policemen in formation. And by then, the students were crowded over where they hoped the regions would come to hear them speak their truth. And these outside forces went in a line directly into the student crowd. They didn't skirt the crowd. They didn't come quietly. They went into the crowd. And I know a student who was shoved. And I know a student who was hit with a baton. I know somebody who bent down to help a young woman who was knocked over by these forces. And when he bent down to help her, he was hit. Not once, not twice, not thrice, not four times or five times, six times with a baton for trying to help her. Who witnessed him? Who bore witness and said that that happened? And I saw my students running toward me screaming because they had started firing projectiles into the crowd. Who reported that? Did you see it in the news? No. Did you see somebody write a letter about it? No. It happened. I was there. I bore witness. I saw it. I saw a young man carried out of the crowd by his friends and loved ones and they laid him down on the ground and he was writhing in pain because he had been shot by projectiles. Three times. Three times. Three times. And because I'm sort of a motherly type, 
I ran over there. And I did whatever I could think of to do, which is like a mother. I put my head on his, my hand on his forehead like he had a fever or something. <laughs> and he was hyperventilating. I think he might have been scared, but I also know he was in pain. He was in pain. Our student was in pain. Who said anything about it? So he went there to speak his truth, and he got shot at. That was wrong. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was an overreaction at best. At worst, it was an attempt to silence our students when all they are trying to do is speak the truth of what's happening to them as they try to rise up to their best potential. As they come to my classes and I try to tell them, you have a right to have your voice be heard, and then they believe me and they go out and they try to have that happen and they're met with violence in the United States of America. And I just want to say that on that day, I felt proud of the students. I felt proud of standing there. I felt honored to witness them speak their truth. And I felt dishonored to see what their truth was met with. So, where do we go from here? I say, keep speaking your truth. Yeah. Let them know what's happening to you. Don't meet violence with violence. Sit down if you're met with violence. Sit down and keep your head down and say your truth. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.